Good morning, everyone. I'm Ginny Wise, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Advancement at Tulane. Thank you for joining us for our second Plug-in to Tulane event. This is a series of ongoing webinars designed to connect Tulaneans around the globe from the comfort of their homes. Each week will feature a different Tulane faculty or staff member discussing the effects of COVID on their area of expertise. And to that end, in just a minute, I will be turning over the Zoom spotlight to the one and only Peter Rusciutti. For the past 34 years, Peter has been teaching courses in finance at Tulane's A.B. Freeman School of Business. He is the founder and director of Birkenrode Reports, the award-winning student stock research program. Peter is also the host of Out to Lunch on National Public Radio, recorded right here in New Orleans at Commander's Palace. Peter has addressed more than 1,200 groups in 47 states and several countries. He is a husband, father, and author, and has attended baseball games in each and every current major league ball ballpark. An organizational note, if you have any questions as the webinar progresses, please enter them in the chat function, as all viewers are muted. If you are on a computer, the chat function is available at the bottom of the screen. If you're on an iPad, the chat function is within the participants area at the top of your screen. And now, please join me in welcoming Peter Rusciutti. Thank you, Ginny. It is, uh, it is good to be here. Uh, I think we got everything going now. Is uh, I'm in my backyard. I'm in my backyard. It's not a green screen. Uh, I'm actually here. I live pretty close to campus, uh, which is great. Uh, if you want to know exactly where I live, um, let's see, I live about four blocks from Snake and Jake's. That would probably be the best marker for, for a lot of you here. And uh, and uh, been here a, a long time. And uh, no, 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 you're the man. No, I mean, no, no, you be the man. I'm doing a webinar here. But too late. Okay, that's fine. The uh, just you know, it, we're keeping it real right here. The um, uh, it is Tulane's doing great, by the way. The faculty have been sharing ideas with each other because let's face it, we're all in it together. Nobody knew much more about all this than any other person. Uh, the administration's been really uh, super supportive of us. I just wanted to let you know that Tulane really has its act together. You should be very proud um, of your university. You know, I thought. This was gonna be a period where I would have this enormous amount of free time and I could get to things I always wanted to. Like I was, maybe I read Tolstoy or uh, get some dance moves and try out for the 610 Stompers. But uh, none of that has happened actually. I'm, I'm doing more, I'm busier than I ever was. You know, not only teaching the class, but um, doing about a half dozen interviews each week and getting emails. Uh, from students back and forth. And the other thing is, um, we're, of course, we're still doing the weekly business radio show on NPR out to lunch. And um, that's still a lot of fun. Of course, you can imagine we're doing it remotely. So the guest is somewhere and I'm somewhere else. And I'm not at Commander's Palace, which is, it takes away a lot of the thrill. I mean, it's one of the reasons people come to the show is they want the free lunch at, at Commander's Palace. So, uh, so we've changed that format. I'm now at home with a box of wheat thins and a jar of peanut butter. but but it's still a great show and we've changed the format. So what we're doing now is talking to try to find businesses and how you can help them, whether it's getting a, an SBA loan or best practices regarding to labor. And that's, uh, and it's been very helpful like that. I think we've, um, we kind of made the turn there uh, just at about the right time. And speaking of that, hats off to our local businesses here. Uh, a lot of them are struggling, obviously. Some of them aren't gonna make it, frankly. Um, but a lot of them have been able to change uh, uh, change course a little bit for the good of the community. Uh, a couple I'll mention to you is a uh, 7-3 distillery, which uh, made um, booze, really made, <laughs> made booze. And, uh, and now they've converted the plant to making hand sanitizer, which is great. It's what it, all of us need. And that's pretty terrific. There's another company called Ready Responders, which was started by a Tulane grad uh, with a tremendous idea. It was basically, uh, still operates, very successful. They've moved it to other cities. It's basically a, kind of an Uber model, but for healthcare and uh, emergency medicine. Whereas, you know, before you could probably get an ambulance to come, you might be able to, they just have cars driving around. 
and they get to them and then they determine at that point if they're gonna you know, really need an ambulance or not. Uh, that's been great. And what they've converted to, or at least added to their uh, arsenal there, is they now have a whole, they've taken that fleet and they have them all in hazmat outfits and they come to your home to test you for the coronavirus, which is, is really awesome. So, you know, people are uh, doing, the, doing the right thing. Um, uh, I had a funny guest on the other day though, and he said, <laughs> He said uh, that he was very upset that his um, insurance did not cover, his business interruption insurance didn't cover uh, the situation with the coronavirus. And, uh, and they, they told him it was because it was an act of God. And, uh, and he retorted that uh, he, in fact, was an atheist and didn't think that should uh, apply to him. So uh, you can see we do have a certain amount of tragedy plus time uh, equals humor. And... Uh, Let's see. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Birken Road reports as a start and what's going on there. First of all, the conference isn't going to take place. It was supposed to be April 24th at the West and obviously everything's been canceled. Um, can't get near each other and the companies themselves are doing everything they can just to hold on. They don't have time to put, to put together a presentation like that. But you would be amazed at how well it's going. The reports are very insightful they are going to be done on time. They'll show up on the website, birkenroad.org, when they're completed. Uh, and it's amazing because we work in five student uh, teams with five students on them. And they're used to working together and moving around as a group. And now they're basically all over the place. Uh, I had a, stu a student group told me that they had, out of the five, they had three that were in different states and two that were in different countries. And yet they're doing it. They're doing it through uh, Skype. Yeah, they're doing it through uh, conference calls. They're doing it through Zoom. If you want to know how confused investors are right now, by the way, Zoom is a great example. You know, everybody wants to buy Zoom because we're using it here. And obviously it's, you know, going through the roof, the amount of business. Um, but just to show how confused people are, there was another stock called Zoom Technologies, which I believe was a bankrupt company in China. And uh, they, they had the ticker symbol Z-O-O-M. And people ran that stock from 20 cents to $20 because they were buying the wrong Zoom. I mean, this is a, <laughs> calm down people, really calm down. I know the, the um, financial news is of course hysterical. I probably best just not turning it on. It's, uh, it's gonna urge you to do the wrong thing. And keep in mind, sometimes the best decision in finance is to do nothing. And uh, that's not what it's uh, emphasizing on TV. I'm watching Wolf Blitzer on the Situation Room and he's talking about the economy. And, uh, and now even I'm getting scared, you know? And I, and I think to myself, if my name was Wolf, I would not grow a beard. That would be the first thing I, I wouldn't do if my name was Wolf. Um, there, uh, in Birkin Road Reports, we're doing a lot of different things uh, this year. We always try to advance the program. We always try to advance the reports. And what we started a little more than a year ago was adding sustainability to our reports. This is something investors really want to know. Uh, issues like environmental, social, and governance issues. And what does that company do? And we basically ask a couple of uh, pretty simple questions. We ask them, what have you accomplished in, this, in these areas in the last couple of years? Uh, what are you most proud of? And what do you have on the table going forward in terms of uh, changes that you'd like to make? And it is very interesting. Uh, you know, I, I kind of have a front row uh, seat to the U.S. economy between the radio show and Birkin Road reports. And, and, you know, it's funny, we go to visit these companies, and I would say not many, out of 40 companies, maybe a couple still look at us like we have three heads, you know, like, what are you asking about environment, sustainability issues? Um, but there's a lot of great things going on in corporate America in that area. We're visiting with one of our favorite companies, Lamar Advertising, and Lamar is, of course, they own all those billboards. And they were working on a plan. They had actually already started rolling it out. They had a VP of sustainability rolling out that the lights on top of those billboards would no longer be, at least eventually, uh, no longer done with electricity the, the way we think of it. And it would be solar panels that would be mounted on the top of the bill, billboard. So it's made me a, a pretty, uh, pretty optimistic, uh, optimistic guy. In regard to the... Um, a little bit more on Birkin Road reports. You can imagine our stocks have been really beaten up, just like everybody else's have been really beaten up. By the way, sidelight is that this market is exactly where it was three weeks ago. I know that seems hard to believe because we had so much angst and and uh, and nail biting and such, but we really have just bounced around in a very narrow uh, narrow range over that point. But we have, uh, like our like everybody else, we've had stocks that have uh, done very well and stocks that haven't done very well. Uh, you can imagine some of the great stocks that we've ended up 
following that have done well in this. Uh, a couple is uh, Sharps Compliance. Sharps is a company that does waste, uh, medical waste disposal. So you can imagine they are doing pretty well. Investors wanted to get a, a piece of that. Another company, uh, they're in Houston. Another company's in Lafayette, uh, LHC Group, which is the second largest um, operator of uh, home health care, uh, sending nurses to, uh, to uh, people's homes, you know, when they're coming out of surgery and things like that and, and just need help. So they've done uh, very well. The real bottom spot is not surprising, and that's been the oil service companies who were doing very poorly before all this, and now they've got this double whammy. And the double whammy is that demand has fallen off a cliff uh, because of the coronavirus, just people aren't going and moving around a whole lot. And then this spat between Russia and the Soviet Union has uh, ended up in a lot more supply. And uh, you just have to take that intro course in economics to know where prices, <laughs> prices are. It's been pretty, it's been really brutal. Uh, last week, uh, Hornbeck Offshore uh, declared uh, bankruptcy. Uh, you know, it's a company with an amazing fleet of offshore supply vessels that serve the, uh, the rigs offshore uh, and incredibly smart management. But, you know, it's the, it, the tone is just very difficult to operate in this area. There's probably going to be more companies that, uh, that lose it down, um, down the road, which is, uh, which is kind of sad. Um, the, um, one of the things about Birken Road that is, is actually more important now than during the good times is the students really... Uh, understand risk. And I've, I've got to put out thanks to Marie Daigle and Anthony Wood and, and Dee Fuchs on our staff. They have kept the oars in the water. And, and I don't really know how. They've really kept things on a timeline and uh, in a very difficult situation because we're usually all on top of each other. But um, one of the things that we do there is we really help students understand risk. And a lot of the reports are about understanding risk, whether it's um, balance sheet risk or it's uh, uh, operational risk or maybe how tied to the uh, is this company to the overall economy or maybe a specific commodity like oil or or something like that and um, our, our reports are filled with those things and frankly when things are going well when the stock market's going up people don't tend to read that part they they tend to overlook it they think you know no problem I don't even know what this company does. It's a ticker symbol and it's going up. I'll have it go up some more and I'll, and I'll uh, sell it to somebody else at a higher price. But now, now that's the thing you want to know. I mean, because you have to, you know, things are, when things are good, you don't have to. But now when things, you're in a bear market, I mean, you know what they say? They say, uh, you know, you don't know who's been swimming naked until the tide goes out. And, uh, and this is the greatest, best way really to, uh, to learn about it. Um, a couple of other things I wanted to, uh, mentioned to you is uh, the overall market. That was probably what a lot of people came out for. The overall market has been uh, brutal. I've been in this business for 40 years and I've never seen it fall so fast, so fast. Now, one of the things you need to recognize is what history tells us. And history tells us that a bear market lasts about 14 months on average since World War II. That's about the average. And the market on average falls about 33%. Uh, this is an odd situation in that we've already fell at the bottom 30%, so pretty close, and um, it only took a month. Uh, so we're so it's interesting to see where we where we go from uh, uh, from here. And a lot of people are saying, you know, but 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 uh, you know they they're all using the four most dangerous words in finance. Uh, this time it's different, and uh, it generally is not different. Uh, now the seven most dangerous words overall are, hey, we're getting the band back together, but that's a that's a whole other subject. Anyway, they, uh, and if you, one of the saddest things you remember from the 08, 09 recession was people got out and maybe the market fell further and they felt like they had done something good, but generally they never got back in. And that was the real problem in all of that. They, they were scared and the market kept going up and they kept getting more scared and they missed an amazing rally. The longest bull market in history. It lasted almost 11 years. It was 94 months under President Obama and 37 months under, under President Trump. It really kept going. In fact, it kept going so long that a lot of people have kind of forgotten that bull markets have bear markets. You know, they, I always think the two systems that work in the world are democracy and capitalism. And capitalism really works, but it's cyclical. That's just the way it goes. It does very well kind of corrects itself and builds a base and comes back up again, which, uh, by the way, I hope is what we all do too. I'd like to believe that we all come out of this uh, better than we went into it. So we will uh, we'll have to 
have to see that. And um, I think, um, uh, Jay, I don't know if you got any questions coming over there. I don't, um, I think I'm probably gonna have some former students, which would be very cool. <laughs> you are getting some great questions, Peter. And, and I can tell that many of these are your former students. Um, so I think you sort of addressed this, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and let you hit, hit it again. Um, it said, uh, with the combination of tourism, oil and gas, and service jobs in New Orleans, it seems that we are particularly vulnerable to a severe downturn. Is that correct? You bet. You really couldn't have come up with a worse combination. Um, I will say, by the way, New Orleanians are really abiding by the six-foot rule, you know, which you know, kind of goes against our culture a little bit. You know, it's, uh, you know I've been running the streetcar tracks to try to not go insane. And, uh, and I'm keeping six feet from them. The other day, I forgot I was also supposed to look out for streetcars. So that was, we almost did not have this event. It is, uh, but no, we were probably more vulnerable than anyone else. Uh, but, um, you know, with, the, with the, pa the, the Senate package that came through, uh, if we can get people stay on their feet long enough, because one of the things that companies tell me all the time is they're trying so hard to keep people employed. I mean, they really are. But it can't, at some point, you just can't do it. You, and, uh, but the problem is on the other side, on the other side, and there is another side to this, we're gonna come out, they don't wanna end up with no workers. So everybody is in a very tough spot. It's, you might, sometimes you maybe think, oh, the boss is running the joint, he's happy and I'm the poor employee, but it, he or she is in really a, a difficult spot. Oil, I just don't know where it's gonna go. It really, uh, they say the Gulf of Mexico now, there's basically no drilling. It's you know, sometimes jokingly called the Dead Sea. And it's, um, it has been, it's been tough. I don't see where the turnaround is going to be. I think we'll get over this supply demand problem, but alternative fuels are coming and uh, they really are. And, you know, 70% of all oil is used for transportation. So that's very, very rough. And the electric car is coming faster than we think it is. It's, uh, um, you know, I talk to people all the time, like uh, people like old timers a lot of time will say, yeah, electric cars, where are you going to fill up? Whole food, you know, and, um, but no, there's going to be, you know, the way capitalism works, we're going to have, uh, you're going to go to bed Tuesday night with no charging stations and wake up Wednesday morning, and it's going to be on every, every corner. So, uh, but we've done a good job of diversifying the economy. That's what I see on the radio show. And I'll tell you, the reason I'm so optimistic about New Orleans is we have had all these young people smart young people, well-educated, come in here, start businesses or expats moving home. And that's, that's really the, the key going forward. And we've become a great entrepreneurial community. In fact, the reason we started the show, Jenny, was because we had become the number one city in the country for young entrepreneurs and people didn't really know it here. And we wanted to kind of show it off. So um, I'm pretty optimistic. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, uh, we have another question here about um, the negative interest rate environment and what that might mean to us. That is uh, unbelievable, really. It just, uh, it goes against everything we teach. It goes against everything you ever learned, uh, but we might get it. Uh, we might get it. This might be enough to, to keep us going. The major $2 trillion uh, spending uh, stimulus bill and the fact that Fed almost has interest rates to zero already. Uh, Europe has gone to negative rates, but, um, and it, it is a very odd situation, but it reminds me of something. People, uh, people have seen their stock portfolio really drop in value. You know, I had a guy the other day tell me his 401k is now a 201k, you know, but it's, uh, but uh, the one thing they didn't, they haven't seen, they're probably just not looking at it, is the bonds in their portfolio have gone up immensely in value because when interest rates drop, bond prices increase. So uh, I don't think we're gonna get to negative rates. Uh, I hope not. I really hope that this is enough to get us, uh, get us through here. One of the other things, Jenny, about where we are is unlike the 0809 recession or the 87 crash, um, we didn't have any idea what was gonna happen next, but we, we do sort of know what's gonna happen next. We're gonna somehow, uh, if we all do the right thing and act correctly, we're gonna get through it on the other side. Now, is it gonna be, May is it going to be October. We don't know, but uh, that's one of the things as an investor you really have to think about. And one of the big keys that investors get wrong is the stock market is anticipatory. So it will start to improve before the virus ends, before the economy starts to come back. And that's why it's so people want to time the stock market. And it's about the most ridiculous thing you can do. It is, uh, it is a fool's errand. And in fact, even think about 08 and 09. In 09, the stock market started to soar in the spring of 09, and the recession didn't end till the fall of 09. So that's a, a good example. 
Peter, let me just say that I do think a lot of these are your students. Um, we will save the chat so you can see their names because I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, I think you sort of addressed this, uh, that you can't time the market, but somebody said at 30% down, are we sure this is the bottom? And I think I know what your answer is. Yeah, no, it, <laughs> and not sure at all. You know, it, certainly during the Great Depression, it went down a lot more than that. Um, we do have more safeguards than we did back then. We didn't, we didn't really have the ability to use fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus to the extent that we do now. And I think that's a, that's a bit of a saving, uh, saving grace in here. Um, and the other thing is maybe it turns us into long-term investors, which is what we teach at Birkin Road Reports. You know, it's uh, the idea that this is a, you know, you got to remember stock certificates represent ownership in a large public company. And it's not a lottery ticket, as Peter Lynch used to say. And uh, maybe people can get back into that longer-term uh, mindset. It's funny, I teach in the business school. Um, and we're talking about one year target prices for stocks and right across the hall is the trading room where they're looking for, you know, what's going to happen in the next 15 seconds. So we, we teach it both. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, a lot of questions coming through on the chat. So I'm, I'm going to try to get through them all. I do want to let folks know if we miss anyone, we will try to get answers and get back to you. And Jenny, how about you had mentioned a tip jar that we would have a virtual. <laughs> <All right>. No. <laughs> It's between us. <laughs> if only, if only. Um, so uh, another question here is about the real estate market. Do you see a real estate crash a month or two out given the joblessness similar to 2008 and nine? I think um, you might, I think the rental market is going to get very, very, very soft, even though, you know, the stimulus bill allows for you to try to, you know, continue on with that. And of course, Landlords, there's, you can't evict people and things like that. But I think there was a shift going on anyway. You know, one of the big shifts, Ginny, is that, like, when I ask my students what they're going to do next, um, they want to live downtown. That's whether it's, uh, it's not uh, just New York and Boston and San Francisco anymore. It's New Orleans. It's Des Moines. It's, it's everywhere. And um, so I think we have a big shift like that. Our students want to uh, walk to work. They want to walk to the dry cleaners. They want to have a cheers bar or something not, not far from, uh, from there. And uh, one student even told me that his idea of hell was to um, actually, uh, let's see what he did. His idea of hell was to live in a cul-de-sac and commute to an office park. So that, um, that's kind of the way we're, <laughs> we're thinking. But no, I, I, think it, I think it'll recover, you know. But, uh, you know, one thing, another thing about real estate, though, is you don't really feel it softening. Like with stocks, you go to your Bloomberg and you turn up and you see that that stock's down 10% for the day, but nobody knocks on your housing, your house door every day at uh, three o'clock and tells you how much the, they're willing to pay for the, uh, for the house. So uh, in a way it's a, it's a, it's a softer price and uh, maybe easier to live with. It's not in your face all the time. So here's another one on a slightly um, different topic. Do you see a possible permanent shift to more remote workforce, or do you think that can help, and do you think that could help the New Orleans economy in some way? Oh, I think it's definitely gonna happen. I, I think the two things I think are just, they're, they're locked in now, is more working from home and uh, more internet sales. Uh, it's gonna be really tough for brick and, bricks and mortar. We have gotten the hang of it. You know, I was, um, um, I'm, I am somewhat of a Luddite. And uh, actually, now that I've done Zoom and these conference calls and the radio show and the class, I'm very comfortable and I like it. And uh, I think that's the way work is gonna be. And plus the fact that work is getting so much more spread out and international. I think one of the, one of the benefits of all this, and I know there's, you know, you worry about, are there any benefits? But our students are learning to work remotely. And I think that is gonna be a huge skill in the workforce, not only in getting uh, getting the job, but once they get in there, I think it's a I think it's a really really big deal. And I think when students are selling that, the way they ought to sell it is not so much I can work Zoom. You know, I guess we're all supposed to be able to do that. But look, at, when I was back home, I was still taking all my classes. Maybe I got a job on the side. I got great at time management, and uh, I really learned how to to handle myself in any kind of environment, no matter how things change. So I think that's the um, that's really the plus side of, of it all. And I think um, in New Orleans, uh, we had a lot of people working remotely uh, anyway. Uh, the, the woman who actually uh, asked the, uh, calls our guests before the show, she is actually in Bolivia. And, uh, and I get the questions which make me sound like I know what I'm doing. But it's, uh, but yeah, 
I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a help on that end as well. But um, New Orleans has such an appeal. Um, I, I really can't see this place just, you know, we talk about from hell or high water. I mean, we had the high water. And uh, I, think, I think we're going to uh, be fine here. So here's another one. Uh, what sector do you see rebounding first in this? I.e., healthcare is busy but not being reimbursed, technology booming. Will we still see growth? I think we will. I think the problem here is that most people in this situation have begun to look for the stocks that can survive in here. They, uh, they've been buying a lot of the food stocks, you know, Kellogg's, Smuckers, things like that, because you still got to eat and such. Uh, then they've been buying stocks uh, like Zoom, the right Zoom, not the wrong Zoom. But uh, they, uh, and they've also been uh, buying some stocks like Peloton, you know, that, you know, you're no longer going to go to the health club. Um, I think it's too late for that game. I think you really have to start investing in the cyclical stocks, the ones that are most tied to the economy. And this might be something that looks awful now, like manufacturing or transportation. And uh, I think that's really where the biggest bounce is going to come from. And I also think, Jenny, that investing is not binary. You know, that I always hear, you know, I'm all in or I'm all out. That is generally not the way to be. I mean, you should be uh, averaging in when you buy a, buy a company or averaging your way out of a market. It's... Um, it's too, it's too tough psychologically to pick a point and, uh, and run with it. Yeah, a lot of people do want you to tell them how to time the market. So, yes. Okay, so uh, is this the bottom? Um, so I, I think you're resisting that. Yes, no, I think uh, uh, I, I d that's a really difficult question. I would, be, um, I would be doing this from a mansion on St. Charles Avenue and not next to St. <laughs> 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 if I knew it, but um, but I am. I think history tells us that this uh, you, you can't time the market, and there's some real opportunities uh, out there. You're starting to see more people talk about it as well, and uh, and everything will change. You mentioned that healthcare sometimes isn't being reimbursed, but um, I think it, I think it's still going to be a great field to be in. You know uh, that LHC group that we mentioned. Um, you know, here's a company that is most of their business is people over 70. And when you look at it, that's where this, this population is going. I'm a young baby boomer. That's the way I'm going to phrase it. Is they, uh, it's, uh, but, you know, they, uh, there's 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day. So if you, a play on that makes a lot of sense. Yep. So, um, and uh, I, I, you're, you're always young to us, Peter. So oh, that's great. <laughs> um, I got that chair, you know, after 25 years, they give you a chair. It's I'm awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you deserve that and more. Okay. Um, let's see. There's a lot of good questions coming in. This one says, the shutdown of businesses and the government response to this has been remarkable. But thinking about the number of new dangerous viruses that seem to emerge every year, how can we afford to respond like this in the future? You know, there was... Uh... We're going to have to, first of all, we're going to have to do the things that weren't done. There was, the government didn't really stockpile ven ventilators or, you know, masks. And uh, they think they closed down the, the office of uh, pandemics. You know, it's, we, we, ha we can't do that. In fact, it's kind of funny. In a way, that's more of a business way to do things, you know, uh, just in time inventory and such. But the government's job is much bigger than that. They don't have to worry about earnings in the, uh, the next quarter. They've got to be able to get us ready for whatever whatever comes. And I think that'll, that'll be the big change going forward because uh, clearly this isn't a hoax. This is a, this is a big deal and we've been uh, running around. And the other thing is I think we're gonna have to work more with other countries. You know, I think we still have a mindset that that's over in China, that's in Spain. It just doesn't matter anymore. And uh, not only from a, a fact that the virus has spread, but I mean, we're all in this together. And uh, I hope, that's one of the things I hope we come away with, by the way. So Peter, we have people asking questions um, reflecting that we have a very large spread of ages of our participants, which is really nice. One big Tulanian family. I've got a new graduate asking, um, where, what do you think the best industry might be to go into at this point? And I've got somebody else asking about retirement. Ah. How to think about their retirement um, plans right now. So you and can you're right in the middle, I guess I could work with you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I think um, I think some of the industries we talked about, like uh, healthcare and technology, are going to continue to do well. Oddly enough, 
uh, the financial services business is, I think, going to continue to do well. It's, uh, it's really, it's not funny. I was going to say a lot of our students that have internships for the, for the summer are now writing to me saying that, because nobody knows what's going on. Of course, New York is a hot spot like New Orleans. Uh, but um, uh, one, of the th one of the things these, these companies are telling them is, listen, you're still, your internship's still on, but um, we're going to have you work remotely for the first half of your internship and then figure out, you know, if we can bring you physically into the building. So, um, you know, that's, I, it's got to make people really antsy because uh, maybe people have jobs, uh, but are they going to pull them, you know, things like that. But I think the remote business is what's made that less likely uh, to happen. On the retirees, I think it's, it's difficult to have the market um, fall apart if you are so close to retirement or in retirement. Uh, one of the rules they always use in financial planning is that you remember that stocks over long periods of time are the best performing assets. They, they really are, but they bounce around a lot. And um, so what happens is in the beginning, you should have more of your portfolio in stocks and less and less and more in bonds and fixed income and cash as you get close to retirement. Um, you know, the old rule had always been, and this is, um, this is kind of a funny rule, but you're, you should put the percentage of stocks in your portfolio as 100 minus your age, which uh, I have that tattooed, actually. It's a very good thing to remember. It's, uh, and uh, so that you're really, when you get close and you don't have time to live through another bounce, uh, this is kind of what happens. I think the problem, there's another great problem out there that nobody's talking about, and that is, uh, um, is pension funds. Uh, these, uh, a lot of people work for the state or the U.S. government and such, and they are woefully underfunded. They have about, on average, about 35% of the money they need if they had to pay out everything today. So that is terrible. What's worse, though, is in the last 11 years, you've had a phenomenal stock market and you're still at 35%. You would have thought those assets would have gone up in value. And uh, I think that's the big deal. A lot of people worry about, you know, Social Security. We're going to be fine. We have a printing press, which is really cool. I think it's uh, good to have. You might want to get one of those. And uh, it's, uh, but, um, but the states don't. And the cities don't. And this is, uh, I think, a real, real problem. I sat on all the states' pension boards for uh, six years, and they were troubled then. And they're, you know, they're even more troubled uh, trouble now and that's a national thing that's not a state-by-state state thing yeah there was a question do you think there will be municipal defaults just I don't, yeah that's a that's a great question i you know with the treasurer's office back uh when i was there you know when i was with the treasurer's office i was teaching part-time at tulane and uh that's when kind of came up with the idea of birkin road reports because people would um they would write to me all the time asking constituents, asking, I want information on this public company in the state or that. And there wasn't anything there. You know, uh, we're a long way from Wall Street. And so I knew we had all these really smart students at Tulane that would like experience and people that wanted answers about local companies. That's how we uh, started doing it. But municipal bonds are, um, uh, you, you're not seeing, if you look at, there's a great way to look at that. If you look at a graph and you draw what is happening to the slope in terms of, um, bond ratings for let's say municipal bonds you notice it hasn't gone up a whole lot so people aren't very much in fear of municipal bonds uh defaulting but if you go to and see look at that same graph on corporate bonds you see a huge increase in the slope and that's where people think if anything cracks that's where it's going to crack and um you think to yourself well the economy's been so good for so long uh why would they have difficult balance sheets and the, but the truth is a lot of these companies took whatever cash they had and they bought back their own shares. And uh, I was on a board, we did the same thing. I'm not throwing stones here, but um, so and be, by lowering the number of shares outstanding, they could increase the earnings per share with the same amount of profit and raise the stock price. And uh, some that isn't the end of the world, but a lot of companies borrowed huge amounts of money to buy back their own stock. And now uh, some of that debt is coming due. I mean, obviously rates are very low, uh, but, you know, you've got your leverage balance sheet in a, an economy that might be down for a while. So that's why the corporate bonds look so much weaker than the uh, uh, municipal bonds here. So Peter, here's an interesting one. Do you think this event will lead to the growth of big government at the expense of capitalism and small business? That is a great question. I just uh, had a chance to promote my belief in capitalism, but uh, I think um, I think people are going to realize that government has a role, and uh, and it's not you know the idea we ought to keep shrinking government, keep shrinking government uh, without thinking about it probably doesn't make sense. We there are certain things only government can do, and this is a good example uh, of it right here. And so I think uh, 
I think there'll be more preparation. I think uh, there'll be more ideas that come out of uh, government. And um, I think it'll be validated that uh, they, they have a role in the uh, society and they have a role in the economy. So here's from someone in finance. Um, hope you and your family are safe. Uh, what do you think will be the impact to the M&A markets? Most of the prime targets have already been taken, okay, taken. seeing more roll-up strategies instead of just buying one company. Uh, that could very, very well happen. One thing, though, on the other side of this equation is now at these prices, uh, a, lot of, a lot of stocks are very attractive for mergers and acquisitions. And I think there's, a, there's people all through investment firms around the country just kind of chomping at the bit. And of course, if they can borrow money, they're borrowing at very, very low interest rates. Uh, the same thing for private equity. You have a lot of companies out there that were um, doing well, and now that slipped back, that's that family's entire wealth is in that company. And I think they're a lot, gonna be a lot more open to hearing about private equity. So that's why I really feel that uh, the financial industry, the investment industry may in fact be sad in a way because you're saying it's at it's somebody else's expense, but. Uh, I think they're going to be very, very busy. And, you know, Ginny, one of the things that people aren't looking at, and you can't blame them because things are so upside down here, is um, to the consumer, this isn't a bad time. I mean, gas, I, I saw a station over on Canal, 86 cents a gallon. And, uh, and interest rates are basically at zero. So if you asked a consumer and you didn't know all this was going on, you'd think that was a pretty, uh, pretty great scenario. That would be great, exactly, if we were driving anywhere, but. Right, that's true. <laughs> I had to go start my car just to make sure. Just fill it up, you know, really, for no reason. <laughs> um, so we, I'm seeing that we have people from all industries signed on here, so it's so fascinating. Um, a dermatologist, people in real estate, people in healthcare, obviously finance people, so glad to see the breadth of, um, of, of folks. And a lot of well, people great. are uh, doing it. And thank and you, Tulane, Peter. They go, Tulane folks go everywhere. Um, so it's, uh, I'm not surprised at all. Uh, um, let me keep trying to get through these questions because there's a lot of them. Um, so uh, this one is from a, uh, you mentioned the rental real estate market getting soft, but what about the commercial real estate market? Will a wave of commercial real estate defaults spread to small or community banks? I think um, in it's funny, uh, you know, banks always seem very vulnerable, but it's the most regulated industry out there. So it's, you're less likely to just be surprised one morning that your company has gone out of business. Um, a lot of things were put in place after the 089, 089 problems. Some of them were rolled back, which I think a lot of people are gonna wish that that hadn't happened. Um, but I think in the commercial real estate, it's gonna be, it's gonna be what end you're in. Like I think if you're in office buildings, I think we may need fewer offices down the road. I think, um, you know, one thing is uh, not your and my, not our employers, Ginny, but you know, some employers have always thought if they work from home, they weren't doing anything. And now it's been proved we're uh, doing a lot. So, you know, maybe we won't need as many offices. I'll give you an example on the other extreme. We follow a company called East Group Properties out of Jackson, and they own all these terminals and warehouses all over the country, actually really right along I-10, all the way to California. And, um, this business is going to go crazy because the more people buy online, uh, the more of these terminals and warehouses you have. I, I think people don't ever think about it, but the reason you order underwear and it's there the next day is because there's a terminal, there's a series of terminals along the way. So I think it's where you are in real estate that's going to count. Um, so here's another question about the... Um market. I see real economic damage driving down the market, but also panic and fear. To what, perce what percentage is this emotion the driver of the downturn? And is that giving an impression of a systematic problem when there is not such a thing? I think uh, the first wave, that first wave was pure emotion. And, uh, but now you're having this kind of grinding uh, number back up and forth as really as investors and analysts try to look at that particular company. 
and um, and what 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 are the factors that are going to be involved there? And so that's what's going on now, and that's the grinding plateau you need before you can really get going again. So um, uh, I do I do think that the emotion, of course, like I said, the the media was not helping us here. This is, uh, uh, I always laugh because it seems like to get to be a talking head, and I've been a talking head many times, the ones that get on all the time are the most extreme. You know, that's, uh, I guess that's the way things go. And, uh, and it's really not fair to, um, fair to folks, but I think we're past that panic stage. We may retest the old lows, but um, this, is, this is more of a, uh, a thinking person's market that's going on now. So um, a little bit now, there have been a few questions about the government, the stimulus package. Do you expect a passage of an infrastructure bill from Congress and would you invest now in infrastructure construction? That, you know, we, that is the only issue that Democrats and Republicans agree on. There is nothing else but the need for infrastructure. I mean, the, you know, it's not just New Orleans that's full of potholes, you know, it's um, the whole country, you know, the, you remember that a lot of the stuff was built under the WPA in the 30s, you know, so it's, it's, it's fallen apart. Uh, no need, no argument about the need for it. It's just how are we going to pay for it? Um, you know, one of the tough parts is before this even happened, Jenny, we had um, a tremendous amount of debt. We were adding about a trillion dollars of debt a year, record levels. And we were at a point, and this has never happened, where the total debt for the U.S. government was bigger than the size of the U.S. economy, the GDP. It was uh, 108%. Now it's it's going to soar another $2 trillion and more than that as we go ahead. Part of that was the tax cut that we got a couple of years ago, uh, shortage of revenue coming in, and, and just a lot of expenses. But infrastructure is the answer. It puts people back to work. It's psychologically better than getting a check through the mail or such because you're, you're out there, and there's such a need for it. Uh, we have a couple of companies that uh, had, you know really got knocked around. They still have been knocked around, but we keep thinking about Like we follow a company – uh, called H&E Equipment, which is in Baton Rouge, and they rent and you see them everywhere. They're, uh, whenever you go buy a site, a lot of companies don't buy that equipment, that crane and everything they rented. And their business would, of course, do a lot better in there. We follow a company called Dasky in Dallas, and they are the largest owner of flatbed trucks in the, um, in the United States. And that's, of course, how you get that tractor and that caterpillar crawler out to wherever it's going to go. But um, that would be that not only would that, that be great for the economy if it doesn't drag us too far into, into debt, but you, it would be a visual, which would be great if you saw people actually go into work. Uh, I think that would give, uh, bring in a lot of optimism. There's a, thanks, Peter. There, uh, we're looking for optimism, I'll tell you. There was a, um, a couple of questions here about um, assisted living facilities, retirement communities. Would that be a focus for the P, um, private equity market? I think so. They are going to have a, a, a soft stretch going, going forward. I mean, because, uh, you know, we uh, obviously Lambeth House here in New Orleans had a, a number of deaths and that was national news. And now the whole country, uh, in fact, uh, you know, any place where people are in close quarters uh, um, is very difficult. But I think that's going to be a, uh, that's going to be a growth area. It's, uh, it's, uh, we mentioned home health care. I think um, assisted living, uh, one of the saddest parts is, you know, memory care is going to probably be one of the bigger, um, uh, bigger issues as well. So those facilities, but uh, I think that'll be a sweet spot in the healthcare side. Um, gosh, the questions are just so diverse. This is fun. Um, would you look for portfolio investment opportunities in emerging economies, for example, South American treasuries? Investment grades are getting adjusted. That's true. I look for both uh, stocks and bonds abroad. You know, Jenny, one of the um, one of the things. First of all, they're cheaper. They basically sell at lower values than the U.S. market does. But I think one of the things that um, maybe not as much for the young people, but people my age um, have really underinvested abroad. Uh, you know, ninety percent of U.S. individuals are ninety uh, are in ninety percent of their portfolios are in U.S. stocks. But what's happened is more than 50% of all the stocks now are outside of the U.S. So you're missing big opportunities. Um, I think unless you're an expert in that country or such, it might be something you want to be uh, uh, towards a mutual fund or a money manager that really knows what's going on over there. It's, uh, by the way, sp speaking about not understanding the investment business, about a year ago I had somebody, I was giving a talk, and the guy came up to me afterwards and he said, uh, you know, Peter, I really enjoyed that speech but it was, didn't pertain to me personally because it was all about stocks. And you see, all my money is in mutual funds. 
It's like, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. what do you think was in mutual funds? Cheese, you know, it's the same stuff. So, but yeah, abroad looks good. <laughs> um, so this question says, economists reckon the U.S. economy as a whole could shrink 12 to 15 percent. What is your estimate? I really think it's going to be worse. I think the, um, I, this is one of those things where it's going to be just awful on the front end and then come back, I think, relatively quickly. Like uh, you're going to get uh, third quarter numbers aren't finalized yet, but we're definitely recessionary. We have negative GDP and it's that second quarter. You know, a lot of people got pretty optimistic about that first quarter number. It's like, wow, you know, it wasn't down that much or job loss wasn't that much. But you remember that was only two weeks of 12 weeks. So it didn't really reflect what was going on. But the second quarter is going to be brutal. I, I saw the other day that Goldman Sachs has uh, GDP falling uh, 24%. So it, uh, it could be much more significant than that. Um, we have another question about New Orleans. There have been a lot of those. And so we love that everybody cares about our hometown and their hometown always. Um, with its extreme focus on tourism as a main industry, what do you think New Orleans should do to diversify its economy? I think, you know, it's frankly, and I love this place. I've been here 37 years and uh, not going anywhere. And uh, <laughs> it's, but um, it has to, it, there's a problem in New Orleans in that it's very difficult to get existing businesses to move here. It's, um, you know, it's not near anything else. You know, like Tulane, I always tell, Tulane's like the best university for 600 miles because you know, there's, not, there's nothing around it. And south of us is just redfish. So that's, there's no universities in the Gulf of Mexico. So, um, but they, I think the thing is, is that um, it's tough to get companies to move here. I know a lot of people in economic development and it's um, because we're, it's the greatest place in the, wor in the world, but it's not bland. It's very different. We have our own cultures and such, and it makes it People are kind of hesitant to move into that kind of area. I've got to tell you about a, we had a guy on the show. He moved his big technology company into New Orleans and he was a nice, nice guy. And he was from Atlanta and he, uh, and he was, so he sit down at the table and I said to him, he'd only been in New Orleans a month. So I got to give him this, but I said, I was just trying to break the ice and all. And I said, uh, I said, well, you're in New Orleans. It is a city of characters. And he said, yes, we have found great diversity within the workforce. And I thought, that's ah, not what I meant. And, um, <laughs> And then, he, and then he, then he said, then he said, why, just the other day, one of our employees asked if he could have the Mardi Gras day off, and I called corporate, and that is not a corporate holiday. They're on point, I'm thinking, that's above my pay grade. Somebody else is going to have to talk to you about that. So that is why we got to build our own businesses, I think is what I'm getting at, and why the entrepreneurship side is so terrific. And I got to tell you, these business incubators, these entrepreneurs that are coming in, they're mostly Tulane grads. I can't tell you how much Tulane is this economic engine for the city of New Orleans. And when I started here 34 years ago, nearly nobody stayed, even the locals. There wasn't any opportunity. You couldn't blame them. They loved the place. But, uh, and now a much, much larger percentage of the people are staying. And it is terrific. It is, it's the best thing that could ever happen at the city. And they're starting businesses. Yeah, it's terrific. And we do, we are definitely a net brain gain for the city, Tulane is. So yep. um, it's as a, as a New Orleanian, multi-generation New Orleanian, I love that. Um, here's one. Where do you see middle market lending going in the region? Do you think there will be a boom in bank finance projects given the low interest rate environment once we come out of the pandemic? That's exactly what I was going to add as the addendum to that. Once we come out, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of hunger uh, for borrowers and there's a lot of hunger from the banks to lend. You know, it's, uh, you, when you get down to it, you know, not the big New York banks because they're, um, you know, they do a lot of different things, but, but gen banks, basic banks, that's how they make their money. They take money in deposits at a low rate and they lend it out at a higher rate. They are very, very anxious to do it. Um, We've, uh, it's been kind of interesting. Uh, Iberia Bank a few months ago was uh, merged with a bank in Memphis. And, uh, and then Mid-South Bank was a bank we followed also in Lafayette. And that's now merged with uh, Hancock Whitney. So still a lot of consolidation, but the drive to lend money and get going again is huge. And I think, I think there's a lot of pent up demand on that side as well. I mean, people haven't just walked away. They've, they've sat, I talked to architects. They're still working on projects with the idea that 
it's not going to happen right away, but I ought to be doing that now. And that's one of the interesting things, Jenny, that we learned from people on the show is what are they doing now when they're kind of shut down? And one of the things, what, what makes a great company great is what you do during the downtime. And, you know, everybody's kind of blowing and going and doing great in the uptime. But the key to coming out is you want to come out better than you came in. And that could be a lot of things. It could be straightening out your finances. It could be remodeling the place. Good time to do it. There's nobody, nobody in there. So people aren't standing still. And when, they, when it finally starts to open up, you're going to see a lot of things that nobody knew people were working on. Right. Right. That's a very good point. Um, by the way, Peter, you're, you're just getting so many shout outs and we, we I just love to see it. It's so well deserved. Um, there's, I'm going to try to combine a couple of questions here just to get something in. There have been a few about the hospitality industry. Um, and, uh, and the question is, will people travel as much? Like even big businesses, will they start doing more things um, virtually? and not travel to see each other. And I think those two questions are related. Yeah, I, you know, I, I did get a call from a speakers bureau uh, last week and asked if I could do a virtual presentation. It's so funny, you know, two lines are ahead of the game, even the people like me that aren't really leading the, the technology push here. And I said, well, you know, I teach using Zoom and she was so excited. She was, you're the first person I've spoken to that can a speaker that can work in it. So there's gonna be a lot of ramping up to, uh, to do this. And, uh, but you know, one of the things is, you know, sure, they go for the speakers and, and learn things and all that. But the real value in those events is networking. And it's tough to network out of little boxes at the, uh, at the top. And, uh, and it is a, you know, the tourism business here is enormous. And, uh, and it just gets better and better, uh, uh, stronger and stronger. This week, we have a gentleman on from the convention center. And, you know, it's a funny business because it's downtown. A lot of people don't see it day to day, but it's generating so much in the way of uh, um, jobs and, and income in here. So, uh, yeah, that's where I think would be. Um, by the way, I just somebody just sent me uh, a note about the brain game piece. A third of local startups are started by Tulanians, I'm, and 11% um, of our uh, uh, student body comes from Louisiana, but 25% stay. So oh. there, there are some of the numbers. So it's really terrific. That's um, the number. That's the, the sentence I'm going to use now. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and we also got a shout out for the LePage Center. Um, there were some questions about your Birkin Road. Uh, I know you had to cancel the the event, but is there anything virtual? And are you still publishing your Birkin Road? Definitely, event? definitely still publishing. We're still trying to figure out if we want to do something virtual. I think it would. It would probably just be me talking about the, the companies would probably be it because uh, these companies, you know, they are busy. They can't really uh, do this. And of course, there's another example. One of the big benefits of the Birken Road Conference, you have 700 investors. It's the networking back and forth. So that's why I don't think this is, this is going to uh, disappear. Well, we're running out of time, Peter. Is there anything we didn't cover that you had wanted to cover? Or any parting remarks? Any parting <laughs> remarks? It, um, it is odd because it's so beautiful out, and yet we're all kind of cooped up here. It's uh, I'm walking around at the grocery store with my gloves, and I'm, I haven't got a mask. I have that bandana where it looks like you're going to uh, you know, rob a st stagecoach. I think that's a good a good look. But uh, we'll come out of this better than we went into it, and uh, and I hope a couple of things. The big thing is. I want us to still be kind to people. I hope that doesn't that doesn't go away because we're uh, we're all in this together. And thank you, Jenny. This has been such a wonderful time. A lot of fun. Well, Peter, you're always fabulous. We are. You're you're a treasure, a gem, um, and you've been terrific for to this institution, going above and beyond. So thank you very much. You. Um, I'll just close by saying um, that next week we'll have another plug-in with Tulane webinar featuring Dr. Richard. Oberhelman from the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. And that webinar is on Monday, April 13th at 11 a.m. Central Time. Uh, and you can look at, you can sign up for that and also view previous webinars at alumni.tulane.edu backslash plugin. So thank you to everyone for joining us virtually and have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.